So what happened with the Fiji's foreign relation when the government underwent upheaval in 1987 and 2000? We, uh, we had uh, some problems. We had to uh, renegotiate uh, with, the, with the government where we had uh, diplomatic, with which we had diplomatic relationships. Eh? Uh, it took them some time to acknowledge the change in the government and only after uh, in fact uh, the Papua New Guinea government or Papua New Guinea was the first nation to uh, recognize the new Fiji uh, so there was no need to change our our status with them the others took some time they wanted to they wanted to uh, send uh, uh, people in to look at what was happening. They got reports from their representatives in Fiji, the High Commissioners and the Ambassadors here at that time. Uh, and a lot of them stayed on through that, that period until we became, until I declared a republic in, uh, in uh, October, on the 7th of October. And they recognized the republic and uh, the representatives uh, continued. We had to renegotiate uh, trade uh, with Australia and New Zealand. Spartica was suspended with us and we had to try and get back. The military cooperation with both Australia and New Zealand and America uh, was suspended. The British did not suspend military assistance because we continued to uh, send our cadets to uh, send us and military establishments. And France, which didn't have a relationship with us, opened up military cooperation with us at that time. So, and Indonesia. Uh, and Malaysia was very quick to take it up and uh, renew the relationships. So, there was mixed feelings from the international community. There were those that uh, saw us as very bad boys. But there were so, uh, some saw us, oh, they're just growing up. They're going through growing pains. They'll have to change. They will have to, say slowly they will go back into the, uh, the straight path. Um, so what is the United Nation doing to help the people of Fiji? I mean, does the United Nation play a part in Fiji? They have their agencies here, the uh, UNDP, uh, and they have, um, they have their other agencies in, in the geological and preservation and conservation uh, aspects of our, uh, of our ecology. Uh, they are helping Fiji with the provision or asking Fiji to be contributors and troop contributors in our peacekeeping efforts around the world. Uh, that's about it. That's about all the uh, United Nations can do apart from the uh, watchdog role in uh, our record of uh, human rights, fundamental freedoms, etc. So they, they look at that and how we treat our women, how we treat the children, uh, how we treat the whales and the fish. So those conservation and equality uh, issues on the United Nations agenda, they still play uh, watchdog on as far as Fiji is concerned. Now let's talk about this uh, thing here. Like most, how many percent of the land is owned by Fijians? Because there's a big uh, controversy over this thing, how like Indians are farming the land in the West and their leases are expiring, mm. and the Fijians are taking back the lands, but they're not farming it. It's just growing into for forest. They want more money for it, and uh, and they won't renew it for 99 years. They only do it for 25 years. I mean, that thing will hurt the economy because if they don't have the land to farm it, Fijians won't farm it, and it's gonna hurt the economy. I don't think we should worry about it because the Fijians will soon realize that they need the tenants. The Fijians will very soon realize that they will need those tenants. First year, when there's no lease money coming in because nobody's using that land, they will want the tenants to come back. And the tenants will say, we're not coming back if you're not you're going to treat us like this again in 30 years' time. We want a better deal. So it's up to the representatives now to work that, out that better deal. But, but worrying about whether we're going to be... The economy will go down. It will slide for a while until people realize, look, we need each other. The landlord needs a tenant, the tenant needs the landlord, the, the legislators need to put into place a better 
arrangement between the landlord and the tenant so that the country grows. Now let's talk about like fishing rights here. To, I mean, how, how many percent of the land is owned by Fijians? Eighty-seven percent. Eighty-seven percent. Thirteen percent of the Fijian land. Uh, sorry, seventeen percent of Fijian land has already been alienated. Alienated means it was never claimed or it was bought before the Land Claims Commission set in the early parts of uh, the colonial days. Uh, 1874, 1875, 76 was the Land, land Claims Tribunal where Wilkinson went around Fiji and said, whose land is this? Mine. Whose land is this? The European says, that's mine. How did you get it? I bought it. What did you, uh, how much did you pay? Oh, I gave them one bottle of rum or something. Okay, from where? From this point to that mountain. Now they recorded that, and then they came back and surveyed it, and both sides agreed, yep, this is theirs, this is mine. And after that, they realized that 17% of the Fijian land had already been alienated, or part of it was not claimed. Whose part is this? No, nobody. Nobody claimed it. So it was put as Crown Schedule A. Nobody claimed it. And then there were other land which was seen and even go, oh, it belonged to so and so, they're all dead. That was Crown Schedule B. Uh, land that was identified as belonging to a land owning unit, but they had all gone extinct. They, everybody has died. So all that land make up the 17% that I'm talking about. 83% is tribally or uh, owned by the Matangalis in Fiji. The fishing rights are not owned by everyone. We Interfish. We can fish uh, communally. But if you want to go and sell your fish, you need a license. And to get a license, you go to the real fishing rights owner, which is the chief. May not be the chief in our area if this is one tribe. If you want to fish in our, uh, in our tribal fishing ground, we may not be the owners. The owner might be the, the lady in Rewa. She owns the whole of the Rewa fishing ground. Well, we go to her and she says, yeah, okay, we give the license, the governor issues a license. That is for commercial exploitation of our fishing ground. If you want to just fish for, for food or for, for fees or anything, you just go, you're free. So, um, where does, uh, what kind of resources we have in Fiji? Let's say we have copper, we have sugar cane, we have gold. Right, I mean, we have these natural resources. Mm. So, where does all this money goes after the export? I mean, we never hear about them. I mean, what does? I mean, I mean, there is a lot of money coming in from these things. Well, uh, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. There can be a lot more if we uh, if we uh, exploit or use our our resources better. For example, with the, with the sugar. At the moment, we are sending raw sugar. A lot of people are saying. Why don't you refine the sugar before you send it? Uh, and the people are saying, no, no, let them refine it the way they want to refine it. If we do more downstream processing, instead of we have changed from sending logs overseas to now sending sawn timber, instead of just sending sawn timber, we, do, we, we, send, we export furniture rather than timber. Uh, we export uh, finished products rather than raw material. This is the concept of the colonial days. The colonial powers of Europe came and established the East India Company just to send raw spices back to Europe. And they manufacture it there and send it back to the Europeans working in India. You know, we send our sugar back and they process it and send us lollies or whatever. And now we make our own lollies. Now we make our own sweet waters and things like that. So a lot of these things can be done. We don't need the money to come back. We need the money to be made here, spent here for growth. But we need our export because of the uh, foreign exchange. We need uh, foreign uh, money for our to buy imports. There are certain things that we cannot produce in Fiji. We haven't found oil, although there are traces of it uh, being seen, uh, which needs to be exploited a bit more or explored a bit more. If there is really uh, uh, fossil oil or gas available, then uh, we should uh, explore that and develop it. 
but we need export money for our imports. So when um, when when there is a coup, right? The, there is a lot of money required to do a coup. So where did they get the money to stage the coup like that? I mean, no, there is no money. No money required to stage a coup. I didn't have any money. So I don't know why, why what happened in 2000. Whether there was money or no money. But in two in 87 there was no money. Nobody needed any money. We had all the weapons and the ammunition available in the army at the time, which we used. But for 2000, I don't know. There's a lot of talk about money. So, uh, but where would they have used that money? The real money after 2000 was the money to feed all those people who were in, in parliament. Where did that come from? That is the answer to the question to ask. In 87, we didn't need to feed anyone. We fed the uh, politicians we held in camp, but they were fed from our own ration in camp, already budgeted, already budgeted for. So there's no money in 87. There's no need for us to get any money. So um, let's. So what what is the role of British government for Fiji today? I mean, how yeah. does they fit in? They're just a development partner. Like Australia, like New Zealand, like Tonga, they all partners in growth. Uh, they have no direct role in our governance. Like America, they have no direct role in our governance. So, how many political parties we had? You mentioned earlier there was only two of them that went to England for preparing yes. for independence. What what were they? The Fijian. Uh, the National Federation Party and the uh, Alliance Party of Fiji. But the Alliance Party of Fiji was, in fact, the cooperation of three political parties. The Fijian Association, the Indian Alliance, and the General Electors Association. They together form the Alliance Party. The National Federation Party was also a federation of, the, of two or three cane farm uh, cane farming community based political groupings and they formed themselves together into the National Federation Party. In 1987 uh, 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 on 19 uh, or oh, after 19 in 77 and after that they had the, they, they broke up again the Federation Party broke up and formed a, uh, a flower faction and a dove faction. And later on, the same National Federation Party broke and part of it became the Fiji Labour Party before 1987. So how many parties we have now? We have so many parties. We have uh, more than 14 Fijian political parties. But for the Indians, there are basically two parties, the Federation Party and the Fiji Labour Party. So, why are there so many Fijians? I mean, is Fiji, everybody wants to run their own way, or is like, what is the idea behind it? Just political immaturity. Uh, somebody believes he wants to uh, get into parliament, so he forms his own party. He doesn't realize that politics is a game of numbers. The more parties you have, the smaller the numbers in your party. The fewer parties we have, the more numbers you have in your party. Interesting, very interesting. So, uh, let's talk about um, what rules, laws and custom change like before the independence and after the independence and when you were the president, you changed the constitution and there was there were some changes in constitution, right? Mm -hmm. So, let's talk about before the independence. You remember? Oh, the constitution then was, uh, was not a written constitution before before independence. Then we got the 1970 uh, constitution. And constitutions are just simple documents uh, governing the governance of a nation, the structure of government, the structure of the House of Representatives, the structure of the House of Review, and the basic uh, requirements needed for the 
uh, administration of a civilized society, like what you do about the law, what are the basic requirements of the law, how do you treat uh, those who break the law, uh, so that everybody's fundamental rights and freedoms are properly protected in the Constitution. The national values are embodied in the Constitution. Uh, the <coughs> on the customs, uh, you talked about, which customs were you talking about then? Fijians and Indians. There was recognition of customary rights, uh, customs and usage rights. Uh, they, you acknowledge those existing things. For example, you, you would acknowledge a Hindu putting a spear or uh, some a spike through his cheeks. If you did that and you were not a Hindu, you could be uh, charged for uh, uh, self-injury, injuring yourself. You're risking yourself uh, infection. And uh, if you get infected, you go to hospital incurring public costs on your treatment. You know, but if you do it as a political, as a, a religious right, you don't get charged. So there is recognition of your religious freedom. You are free to exercise your religion the way it is normally exercised. But if it involves the killing of another person as sacrifice, you're not allowed to do that because that is um, uh, that is the the law the law that uh, controls the conduct of the religions. So that's what we have constitutions for. So you changed the constitution in 87. Mm -hmm. So what was the changes in the constitution? Mostly to, uh, to acknowledge the fear of the Fijians and put in place measures uh, we felt would alleviate their fears. Like in the 1990 constitution, which came about after 1987, there was to be a Fijian prime minister. There had to be a Fijian president. Uh, there had to be a Fijian majority in the house, etc., etc. Uh, although the Fijian majority in the house is now supported by uh, by uh, numbers, because the Fijians now make up more than 50 percent, we also make up more than 50 percent of the numbers in the house. That is now, you know, logically, mathematically sustainable. The, uh, the other things was just measures to try and uh, and stabilize the country. So the 1990 constitution was a stabilizing constitution. It was a constitution that uh, facilitated our return to normal constitutional and parliamentary rule, which we got into in 1992 in that general election. Once we were in there, we had the right to change the constitution again because the mandatory review period of seven years was up in 19, uh, 1997. So we had to produce, we had to review the 1990 constitution by July 97. We not only reviewed it, we reviewed it, we amended it, and we enacted uh, a brand new constitution, although we maintained some of the characters of the old uh, constitution of 1990, the 1997 constitution uh, was the one that was all embracing, that it uh, answered the basic requirements of the United Nations and the international conventions on how we treat each other in a place called a country or a nation. So, um, Is, so what is the constitution stating now? Uh, Indian can be a prime minister now? No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say a Fijian uh, an Indian can be prime minister, nor does it say that a Fijian can be prime minister. It's raceless. So anybody can be? Anybody can be. What about president? President, anybody can be. Now, I think the Fijians are afraid, let's say, if the Indian becomes the Prime Minister and there's a majority in the parliaments, they think Indians will change the constitution because they are in power and, you know, put, um, you know, everything in their favor. That is the fear, but it cannot be done. 
They cannot change the constitution just like that. Any change in the constitution must be the result of cooperative effort, cooperative effort between the Fijian representatives and the Indian representatives. Because none of them, no Fijian uh, group, no Indian group can change the constitution without the cooperation of the other because you need two-thirds majority. And none of them form two-thirds of the majority. But if a party is strong enough to have two-thirds of the majority of the House, two-thirds of the House, then they can change it. But that party will not be there as totally Indians or totally Fijians. Now, why can't we have a, a, a constitution like in U.S., you know, like with Ten Amendments? It was made long time ago and they still follow that and nobody can change it. I mean, they can add to it, mm. but they cannot change it. Why can't we have something like that in Fiji where, like, both people's right and culture and religion are pro protected, but, you know, like, you know, and... Uh, you know, uh, why can't we have something like that? You know, we don't want people changing it every five years or ten years. Well, what they do in America is exactly what we, we do here. We amend the constitution. We don't change the constitution. You just have an amendment. You have so many amendments in the American constitution, but you cannot change the, con the American constitution as such. But you can amend a certain aspect of it, add to it, delete from it, and so, uh, which, which, which our constitution is also open to. So... Um you know, I mean, uh, is there anything else you want to add, like, you know, something, you know, you think I should know, I mean, uh, you think it's important for, like, you know, people of Fiji should understand, or like, uh, uh, let's talk about your book, uh, I forgot, um, you wrote a book back in 80, 95 or 96, you wrote a book. Rumbuka of Fiji? Yeah, I think you wrote There's it. one, No Other Way, and there's uh, Rumbuka of Fiji. So what was all those books about? The, no Other Way was really an account of the coup and uh, that as the title says, and as I told you in earlier part of your interview, uh, it was wrong, but there was no other way. You see? It was wrong, but there was no other way because I, that was the only way I could see of stopping Fiji plunging into racial uh, ravine that would have been difficult to get out of. And 2000 demonstrated or ill, uh, vindicated me because I said this could happen and be people didn't believe it. 2000, it happened. And we're still coming out of it now. See, in 1987, we recovered in a matter of less than five years. And we broke the, we, but we put the race questions in the back burners and we didn't forget it. So nine years was too short. In that, uh, in that, uh, in that period from 87 to 99, 12 years, it was too short. And 99 brought in a new, an Indian prime minister. So the thing was still, oh, this is exactly what we didn't want in 87, let's. And the Fijian moved and they cost 2000. But the other book, the 2000, uh, the, uh, the one that came out in 1999, uh, from Book of Fiji, is a more uh, philosophical look of life, uh, at life, my own uh, biography. Uh, and uh, it's a better reading than the, uh, the 1988 one, on, uh, no other way. So, uh, did you sell a lot of books? I mean, how many? It's all sold now. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, just wondering whether it's time to uh, ask for a reprint. And how many did you print? I don't know, it's about 10,000. It's very small. Both of them? Uh, the other one was less than 10,000. But the, the letter book is something that uh, perhaps the young people of Fiji should be encouraged to, to read. Eh? That's my biography. See, people are still reading uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, my experiments with truth. It's a very good, uh, he said it's not his biography, uh, not autobiography, that one, an autobiography by Mahatma Gandhi. But he called it uh, my experiments with truth. Uh, it's something that uh, you should keep for the reading of the current generation so that they avoid the pitfalls we fell into and also so that they can understand why their world is as it is. What happened? What, what, why do I uh, feel this fear from that area? Why? I don't have any problem. I went to kindergarten with, with uh, Mr. Diwan Maharaj's grandchildren and my, in fact, my granddaughter was very, my granddaughter 
and my daughters went to multiracial schools. So, you like Mahatma Gandhi's concept? I mean, of uh, you know, I mean, uh, passive I, resistance. Yeah. You well, a lot of people call it passive resistance, but Mahatma Gandhi's passive resistance is very, very close to the border. Eh? Very, very close to the border. It was. Uh, maybe passive in nature because they were not offensive, but it was disruptive. So it was disruptive. What they were doing was disruptive to the uh, to the machinery of government at that time. Non-violent, but disruptive. So people sort of glibly say, "Oh, it was non-passive, non-violent." I mean, it was non-violent. It was passive. But when you look at it from, if you were the government, somebody was doing that, they'll be a, a thorn in your side, be irritating you. And I felt that the Indian, the, the British government in in uh, in India at the time was uh, was probably feeling that. But then he was persistent. He did that not only in India; he was doing it also in Africa. And while he was doing it, he was also thinking about the Indians in Fiji. So have you met him? I think I think he came to Fiji right once. No, no, he wouldn't have. He wouldn't have. Uh, he was born in 1948, and that was he was pretty close to uh, the end of his time at that time. Uh, India got independence in 1947. I was born in 48. Uh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's it's amazing, you know. It's I hope you can make something out of uh, what we talked about. Yeah, I know. I mean, I really appreciate you helping me, you know, and giving me this much time, you know. I mean, and I will, I will, you know, definitely. Send you a copy, you know, like in yeah. a couple of years. You know. Yeah, you know, I've done a lot of these before, and I, s when the final product comes out, I get about two minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. You know, it's, it, they are all part of what you're going to put together. Yeah, it's, it's about the whole story. You yeah, know. my story is a very small part of the whole story. Yeah, of mm. the whole of Fiji system. I yeah. Mean, you know, but, I mean, you change the face, you know, like, of Fiji, like, that's what you know, a lot of people think. I mean, you know, I mean, if you have not done the coup, there mm. won't have been because nobody knew what coup was about. Mm. Nobody knew what was coup. Coup before that. I mean, mm. after you did it, everybody knows. So everybody wants to do it. Mm -hmm. if somebody is is nobody is happy with the government change. That. But my coup is not the first coup in Fiji. There were a lot of traditional coups even before that. You know, there were leaders who were clubbed to death and new leaders installed in the traditional sense. And there was a, in the Bible there was a coup. Cool king uh, Saul was still in the throne when King David was anointed as as his replacement. You don't do that. You wait for the other guy to die, and then you anoint a new king. But uh, well, that's the nature of, uh, of politics. It's not a new thing. We call it uh, coup d'état, uh, and that's a French word because there was no no word for it in in English in the, of somebody doing that. Uh, the coup against the state or a blow against the state. When Cromwell did it in uh, in uh, against Charles the First, nobody knew what it was. It's, uh, and the United Kingdom was a republic for a while. They didn't have a king. We all were Cromwell as uh, head of government. And then uh, Cromwell's uh, Cromwell's son took over. And then he didn't do a good job, so they sacked him and made Charles the Second as king. So they went back into a, a monarchy. Uh, so um, uh, let's. When you made Fiji Republic of Fiji, so mm -hmm. what is the difference between before there was a regular Fiji and Republic? What does it mean? The Queen. We had the Queen. We had the Queen as the the monarch as the Queen of Fiji. When I staged the coup and sacked the Her Majesty's government of Fiji, I effectively cut her reign in Fiji. Anything she had in Fiji, any uh, royal power she had in Fiji, I terminated. I made myself the new king of Fiji, and then I gave transferred all that power back into the new president. I, I appointed a president, and I say, all the powers that were with the queen, I now have, I give to you, you appoint a government of the people of Fiji. So how did how was her reaction? I mean, what did, did say? She she because she, at the time when we had it in Fiji, she had gone through it so many times in Africa. 
in Nigeria, in Ghana, in, uh, in uh, Uganda. They'd gone through it so many times before that. And in each of those countries, they had, had a, few, a few of those in each country. So she didn't care? No. When we spoke in 1997, she said, oh, it's, it's part of growing up. Uh, and I was thinking at the time, why don't you come back as our queen? We remove our president, you come back as queen. And she said, well, if that is the will of the people, it must come from the people. Mm. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. I think so you have, have a... You have talked to a lot of... You have met a lot of big people, uh, big presidents. You have met a lot of... Some. We have, we have, we have been to a lot of countries too. Yeah. Yeah. I met... Uh, uh, President Clinton during his time. Uh, in fact, I have a picture here of uh, him and uh, Hillary Clinton, and me and my wife, and uh, a few of the other leaders around the world. We, in fact, we had a very good reunion in uh, 1995, which was the 50th anniversary of the United Nations, uh, which was a very good uh, reunion at the United Nations, 50th anniversary. All the people, all the presidents and the kings of around the world, members of the United Nations, were present. Where? In New York, UN headquarters. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So you have you have seen a lot. Maybe that's what have helped you grow a lot. Yeah, that helps. You know, it helps to be out there. You know, when you see your problem, that Indian and me, you, you think you got problems. You go out into the world and say, "Boy, they got problems. What we? Why are we calling this a problem?" Yeah. Yeah. So what not. did you see? I mean, oh, well, well, I was, I, I saw the. Uh, I was fortunate because I went to Lebanon and I saw those, the problem. I served in Lebanon. I served in Sinai, but after our coup, then the European, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and those, uh, Commonwealth of Independent States had their intra, nation, uh, national problems. You know, the ethnic cleansing and all those things, and so, so uh, bad. And I'm, so I'm glad we got a strong. Uh, national spirit here in Fiji, so we didn't go into that. The, the other thing that's good for us is that we have two very strong cultures, Fijian culture and the Indian culture. These stro two strong cultures, although they're seen as exclusive, mutually exclusive, you know, they reject each other, it is also good that you have two strong cultures because you can still re retreat to your own cultural strength to, uh, to use to bring the two races working together. Not integrated, but cooperating. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I have... The world is a whole different place now than before. That's right. It's completely different now. Mm. I mean, mm. Fiji has no problem. Mm. Well, we call it a problem, but you go out there and you say, oh, it's a picnic in Fiji. <laughs> yeah. Like two boys throwing sand at each other on the picnic beach. But that's what politics, politicians do. It's power struggle. I mean, you know, politics is completely different. That's what politicians do. It's like, in you know, a power struggle, you know, you vote for me, it's like, you know, it's just a power struggle. That's yeah. What. It is it's just trying to uh, upset the, uh, the balance so that the balance favors you, so that you're in control. But, you know, uh, control doesn't mean total dominance. It doesn't, it doesn't have to mean total dominance, which is the fear in Fiji. It, the fear in Fiji is that if the control, political control, is in the Indian hand, it means we're going to be dominated. It doesn't mean that. Even if the control was in the Fijian hand, the Fijians, the Indians will not be dominated. Because there are rules, there are uh, structures in place, as checks and balances on the use of absolute power to absolutely corrupt. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay. Give me a copy of that when you're ready. And you'll get back to America or whatever you're going to do. Thank you. I will say something. Mm.
the companion of the Order of Fiji. Uh, this is the Order of the British Empire, which I got as a, uh, given to me by the Queen in 1981, OBE. <coughs> this is the Legion d'Honneur, a French decoration for bravery in uh, Lebanon. That is my own thing from India, uh, Staff College. I went to Staff College, so. I was decorated by the French government, the British government, and the Fiji government. <laughs> No. So, which are your favorite books here? Well, I like. Uh, I'm just fi just finished this one. This is uh, Joseph Sada, uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, advisor, and I'm I'm quite interested in these ones. This is Ram Dass, is a Hindu. Hindu uh, thing. What it's about? It's uh, the Hindu philosophy about. Uh, this is about the uh, an old man who uh, uh, who had no concept of death. This guy. He's a uh, he's uh, a European man mm -hmm. who had no. No idea, no concept of death, uh, and he <coughs> just, and he nearly died. So he said, that "There must be more to life than than what he still, what he thought of at that time." And he started looking deeper and went into Hindu, Hindu, Hindu religion, got himself a guru, and started working with him. And he himself became a guru and called himself Ramdas, servant of God. Yeah, Ram Kedas. <laughs> Wow. And what else you have here? Well, Blood from Stone, uh, Osama Bin Laden, and uh, the uh, the Secret Financial Network of Terror. I just read this sort of interesting. Oliver North, Under Fire, good friend of mine, Oliver North. We, uh, we, go, we belong to the same prayer group in Washington. And uh, the Dalai Lama's own book about uh, dying. Uh, the Mahatma Gandhi's uh, autobiography, story of my experiment with truth. It's a very, very, very good reading. Very simply written. Uh, it, I think the, the Japu translated it. Did a very good job. Translated from uh, Gujarati language. Really? Yeah. Very interesting. Yep. Very interesting. You know, it's like yeah. it's, uh, it's. This is one. I am that. It's a. Uh, this is a businessman in uh, Bombay, Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj, uh, the modern day guru. He was a, a simple shopkeeper in, uh, in Bombay. Died in 1959. So he's a modern day guru. What is it about? It's just his uh, views about life. People come to him, they ask him, uh, Guruji, what do you think of this? And he would come straight out with the answer. People from all over the world. He'd, and there's this, this guy from, I think, Norwegian, who just sat there and translated the question and the answer. And put it into this book. So what you have learned from life so far? I mean, what is one lesson you have learned? I think life is for living, you know, you just live life. Live life in the way you believe God designed for you. You see, uh, <clears throat> there's no, 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 no point going through life complaining about this, complaining about that. When you can, when you are at peace with what you feel God wants you to do, and you go and do that, then life is meaningful.